Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Alcohol has always been a part of my life. As a very young girl, I can remember seeing... Um, a cocktail glass with some kind of amber liquor that I thought was just so pretty, and, you know, it makes that tinkly-tink sound when the ice cubes hit the glass. But I can remember, as a very young girl, alcohol was how you had fun. My mom and dad always drank. Um, Their friends always drank. Um, We were allowed to have wine with dinner occasionally, just a sip here and there. And I can remember taking beers to my dad, you know, and I always thought it was so funny to shake up the beer and give it to my dad. Um... He didn't really think that was funny. Um, My first drink was probably when I was, you know, a little girl, three, four years old, probably the same age as my oldest daughter now. I mean, it wasn't an alcoholic drink. It was just, you know, Dad giving me a sip. But the first time I drank alcoholically, I had, I think, probably two bottles of cold duck to myself. I was 13 years old. I threw up, blacked out, and passed out. And I could not wait to do it again the next weekend. Um, It got me out of myself. For some reason, maybe being the child of an alcoholic myself, I I wasn't really happy inside, and I I wasn't really sure what was going on. I just knew that I I felt bulletproof when I was drinking. I loved the way it made me feel. I was funny. I wasn't intimidated by people. just that magic elixir that is alcohol. Um, And as a young person, now in retrospect, it just makes me kind of sad that I thought that's what I needed to become entertaining, um, valid. And then as it progressed, you know, it just was like a every weekend kind of thing, Um, going out with my friends and getting trashed, man. Um, Right. But it began in high school when I started drinking. Um, But 13-year-old children really aren't supposed to be drinking. They're supposed to be, like, playing soccer, softball, um, hanging out. Um, But like I say, in my family, that sort of was accepted. I remember the first time I got drunk, and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't shamed. I wasn't punished. It was just like, well, I guess you had too much to drink. And um, was allowed to sleep it off and... And I went with my, I was with my parents a lot of the times when I was drinking. I was actually with them that night. It was at a cast party. I was, I grew up um, doing theater and dance. Um, so that sort of was accepted. You just, that's what made you cool. I mean, you had to be creative and you drank a lot. And um, now, I mean, I know that it comes from within. And it was just a sad, sort of like that soul sickness that begins as a very young child. But I continued to drink through high school, and I'm sure there was lots of exploits that many of you have had yourself. I remember someone telling me I wasn't able to get alcohol because my parents were there and they weren't being really cool that night. And so I said, "Um, man, I wish I could get drunk. And this guy goes, here, eat this lime. It'll get you drunk. So I ate the lime, the entire lime. Um, just shows you the mindset that I was so willing to get out of myself just to, to lose control. Um, and it makes you wonder what's going on in a person that makes them want to escape so desperately. Um, I always went to church. Church was always something that we were exposed to. Um, but it never filled that void that alcohol did. I never felt... Accepted. I always felt like I was being judged or um, not ridiculed so much, but just sort of, you know how, you know how the adults would look at you and go, yeah, it's just, they're just a stage. But, and I would, I would be so offended. You know, I thought I'm so much more mature than you even give me credit for. Um, I just drink because I like it. Um, But the first time I drank alcoholically, it, I mean, the first time I drank, it was alcoholically. 
And I absolutely adored that feeling. And I, like I said, I couldn't wait to do it again. And so I did on every occasion. And I remember when I was doing my first step when I was in treatment, I was like, well, I'm not really an alcoholic. I didn't never drank by myself. I would fill my Snoopy lunch, my um, thermos with gin and tonic. Um, poor Snoopy. Um, <laughs> So when I got honest as far as that goes, it was it was kind of humbling. And then I remember um, one time I was drinking a beer. This is when I was in college, and I was drinking a beer after I had come home from work, and my roommate came in. She goes, oh, drinking alone. And that caught me off guard, and I got really defensive. And she was like, chill, I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Um, but for me to have that feeling of I am doing something wrong um, gave me pause to think. So through high school, I continued to drink, um, played the piano with my face at my senior prom. I found that out in economics the next Monday. Um, and then went on to college and continued to drink seriously, seriously drink. Um, was on academic probation my first semester, um, 1.58. Woo! Um, and... Um, so, I mean, that's what it was all about. Nobody was there to tell me to go to school. It never occurred to me to skip class when I was in high school. I was one of those preppy kids. You know, I could kind of, I could run with the jocks. I could run with the heads. I could run with the preps. Um, I think as a lot of us are, I was a chameleon. I kind of fit with everybody. I was with those weird theater people. And um, I really didn't hang with the cheerleaders. No offense if there were any cheerleaders, but um, couldn't quite hang with them. Um, so I'm off to college, and I continue to drink, and I begin to get kind of mean. And I had a roommate who told me, Jan, you don't drink like everybody else. You get really mean when you're drunk. And I probably told her to, you know, do something rude. Um, and about that time, my father, who was continuing to drink, um, got sober. And I remember I went to... My very first AA meeting, it was a speaker meeting, and I was listening, and I, afterwards, I looked at my dad and I said, that made so much sense to me. I really liked what he had to say. And he looks at me and he goes, don't worry, honey, you're not an alcoholic. Oh, okay. So I was given permission again, so I drank for another year, and I did subsequently get sober after that, um, obviously. Well, I could be lying, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> my husband sometimes doubts me. Anyway, so let me get back on track. Growing up in an alcoholic home, being around people who continue to drink, really abusive um, verbal stuff going on in my, in my household, which, I mean, a belt across the butt might be just as, I don't know, the verbal abuse can be more insidious, and it, it absolutely destroys your self-esteem. And you really begin to believe those things that are being said about you, that you're stupid, that you're a tramp, that you're... Um, not that I was ever told I was never going to amount to anything, but the way I was talked to or not talked to gave me that sense that I really wasn't worth much. And when I drank, I belonged, because the people I hung out with, they all drank like that, and we all got along just fine. Um, and it just makes me sad that the, the things that I missed as a young person. Um, that's why the Young People's AA is, that's what saved me when I first got sober, because I realized that I didn't have to drink to have a good time. I really thought that was essential. And I thought the people who didn't drink were just lame. Um, and I know everybody feel, felt the same way. I remember when I first got sober, I ran into somebody at college who was my roommate when I was still drinking, and she goes, Jan, where have you been? I said, I got sober about six months ago. She goes, what do you do to have fun? <laughs> and you know what the amazing thing is? Two years later, she was in the program, um, and that still gives me chills. So it, you never know whose life you're going to affect. If you share with them your personal journey, so anyway, I'm in college and I'm drinking, and my dad gets sober, and I had gone to some Al-Anon meetings with my mom, 
and didn't really feel like I fit in there. Um, I didn't quite realize that it wasn't to talk about him, it was to take care of yourself. And I really wanted to, to rag on my dad because he was, you know, not a nice person. But after we went through the family week, and we, I confronted him on a lot of really scary stuff, and we began to heal. Or I should say my sister, my mom, and my dad did. I began to have anxiety attacks. I remember driving home from Atlanta when he was in treatment, and I couldn't catch my breath, and I started shaking, and I started crying. Because I was thinking about the things I had heard, about these people getting stoned and feeling like it was where they belonged and, and about people being drunk and that's where they belonged. But they were miserable while they were doing it. And it made so much sense to me, but my dad had just told me that I wasn't an alcoholic, so how could I make those two places meet? The type of person I, I am, I continue to be, I need a lot of validation from other people. And that's something that I struggle with on a daily basis, finding my validation from God and not through someone else. Um, but at that point, I was very vulnerable, and I needed a lot of validation from my parents, from the people that I loved. So I continued to drink for about a year. I remember coming home, and my folks said, well, you really should go to one of those ACOA meetings, the Adult Children of Alcoholics. And so I went there, and there were a couple people that are recovering, and I didn't know that until I went to my first AA meeting. Um, and they're like, hey, Jen, I'm glad you're here. Um, so I went to those meetings, but I still was really struggling with the anxiety that I had first become aware of when I was coming back from the family week. And I remember I was going to one of my individual sessions I had. This was at the... If any of you are in college and you don't take advantage of your student counseling service, you're really missing out because you can get... If you're paying the tuition, you need to go where they're giving you free shrinking. Um... <laughs> It's good stuff. If you're willing, you should take advantage of it. So this is where I was going for my free shrinking. And I had another anxiety attack as I was driving there. I was holding onto my steering wheel, and I thought, I am going to run my car into the embankment or that thing down the middle of the road, whatever you call those, retaining wall. And I remember being so terrified that I wasn't going to make it there. And I remember it was, I don't know if any of you have ever been on the University of Tennessee Knoxville campus. It's virtually impossible to find a place to park, especially if you're late. So I, it's very dramatic. I run my car up in front of the counseling center, and I run in. I'm late, but I'll be right back. I can't find a place to park. And it, it, we laugh now, but I was really, I was losing it. So he goes, it's fine. It's okay. And so I come back, and we have our little little session. And he goes, what's going on with you, Jan? I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I want to die. I said, on my way over here, I wanted to run my car into the median. And he looked at me, and his eyes got really big. And he said, well, I love you, and I think I'm going to put you in a box and take you to a treatment center. Um, which he did, and I couldn't really accept that. I remember calling my folks. It was kind of like I was in a fog, and we called, and yes, there was a bed for me. But I went to codependency treatment, because at this point I hadn't been honest with him about my drinking. So, oh, I didn't tell you about going up to Montana. Oh, I have to backtrack. This is one of my summer jobs was going up to um, Glacier National Park up in Montana, which was absolutely stunning. And if you're stoned, it's even better. You don't, you don't hike as well, and I don't think you can fend off the grizzly bears as well, but it was, you know, beautiful country. I turned 21 up there, and I remember getting a birthday card from my father, who had been sober about a year, and he said, Dear Jan, happy birthday. I've been sober a year now. It's a family disease, and there's only one way I know how to stop it. I love you, Daddy. And I started crying. I started sobbing because it was so clear, and he didn't preach to me. And that's when I began to understand that it was a disease and not a defective character. So fast forward. I'm back at UT, freaking out, still drinking, not understanding why I can't get it together because, hey, I'm going to therapy. 
Why can't I feel better? Why do I still want to die? So then I go to Chattanooga for treatment. Um, and like I said, it was codependency treatment. So I still hadn't admitted that I was an alcoholic. I knew in the back of my head that I was because I didn't drink like my friends. I was mean. And I remember they would cart us to those damn AA meetings. And I was listening one night. And it's like I stood up when they asked if anybody would like to pick up a white chip. And I just sort of walked up and I got one. And they clapped for me, and they gave me a hug, and it was really cool. And then I was like, holy shit, I've really done it now. I can't drink anymore. So I put it in my pocket, and we went back to the treatment center. I remember we were doing a guided imi imitation. A guided imitation, okay, act like a bunny. <laughs> guided meditation, Sorry. And actually, it was just like a relaxation class we were doing. And I had a spiritual awakening. I had one of those burning bush sensations where I was instantly at peace. I had a vision of my higher power, and I call it my dancing dove. It came up. I had this image of myself as a, as a little person, as a little me, but small, and it picked me up, and it cradled me in its arms, and I started to cry. And it still gives me chills when I think about it, because had it not been for that amazing spiritual awakening that I had, I don't know that I'd still be here today. Um, the spiritual foundation of this program is what makes it work. I realize that I can't do it by myself. I have to have a power greater than myself to keep me sober, to keep me sane. Um, again, my husband would differ. But it's a, daily, it's a daily thing. Each day I have the chance to start anew, and that's a gift. So after I had the spiritual awakening, I was talking with these people. I said, you know, it was really weird. I had like this, I saw this like glowing figure and it picked me up and it rocked me. And I, I don't know, I don't know, maybe if I'm, maybe it's DTs, I'm not really sure. And they're like, no, that was a spiritual awakening. This was someone who had been in the program and was going through codependency treatment. And that's when I began to really understand. And once I came back to Knoxville, I started going to meetings and I was so happy to not have to drink anymore. It was such a gift to not worry about if I was going to be pulled over, if I would show up for class, was I going to flunk out, would I disappoint my parents. Um, still at this point, I was really very still, still very vulnerable with my self-esteem. And something that really helped me was um, affirmations, telling myself, just like that silly Stuart Smalley, I am good enough, and doggone it, people like me. Um, it's easy to laugh at that, but that's very valid. It worked really well for me. I can't keep looking for someone else to make me feel better. The only person who can make me feel better is myself and my relationship with God. That's so important. And I found myself, even in sobriety, when I first got sober, I remember sitting in a meeting thinking, I'm going to find the man I'm going to marry in an AA meeting. This is what was going on in my brain. It wasn't, um, I mean, yeah, I had my moments when I was, you know, gung-ho AA. And um, by the same token, I was so focused on finding someone else to validate me. And in a way, it was good because it kept me coming to meetings. You know, I was looking, I was, you know, scamming on whoever. But they, as long as they were sober, I was, you know, good to go. And I found the group of young people at the 10 o'clock young people's meeting on Friday night. And can I tell you, they saved my life. What I can tell you, if you leave with nothing else, if you stay in the program, stick with the winners, the people who are laughing, who are eating pizza, who are cutting up and just being retarded. You, you're going to have a good time. You can have fun being sober. And as a young person, that's so important to know that this is a really cool group of individuals. Hell, we all used to drink together, but now we're sober together. And the journey is so grand. 
And it is a journey. It's not where you're going to be when you're 16 years sober, where you're going to be when you're three years sober. It's where you are each day and making the very best use of the day you've been given. Because think of your worst day drunk. I mean, and you think, how did I survive that? Each day that you're given sober is such a gift. But I continue to chase people, chase men in AA. And it is God's grace that kept me sober. Because, you know, once you have that really bad relationship where you just can't show your face in an AA meeting again, um, so I didn't. I stopped going to meetings. I chased some guy out to California, which I was reminded of by Bill this, this morning. <laughs> And yes, that's a part of my story. Um, I had relationships in the program before I was, I think I waited till I was 90 days sober. I think I did take that advice, but that doesn't mean I wasn't scamming on them. Um, it's like flirting is not really drinking. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, it's just beer. I'm just flirting. So I come back from California, humiliated very embarrassed. And if you're embarrassed in front of a bunch of alcoholics, um, you need to start doing some of your step work a little more, I think. Um, calling a sponsor, getting involved. And that's something I did do when I was, before I got, you know, involved with all these guys. Um, I was where I would go and pick up the literature at intergroup and it was really fun to get involved. I mean, here these old timers think you're really cool and you're doing a really great job when you're out there cleaning ashtrays and picking up chairs and, um, there's something to be said for that. When they say, you know, you don't know what to do, pick up an ashtray and clean it. Throw away coffee cups. Get involved. Do something for somebody else. Get out of yourself. So anyway, so I'm still chasing these guys. Um, and I caught them. And then, you know, I got what I was after and stopped going to meetings. Then I ended up getting married to someone who was not in the program. But he knew that I was sober, and um, it was funny. I would tell him all the wonderful things that I learned in AA, and you know he had the audacity to tell me, you know, you, you just said that you really should like not take other people's inventory, and but that's what you're doing to me. And he called me on it. Here is this person who's never been to an AA meeting in his life, and he's telling me that I'm not working a really good program. So you know, forget him. But we did get married, and we stayed married about two and a half years. I was not working a program. I wasn't going to meetings. And I wasn't a very nice person to be married to. When I look at it, it's real easy to put all the blame on him and say, well, he, you know, was a loser. He wasn't going to amount to anything. But you know what? That was a reflection on me. When I look at everything that I was saying about him, that was such a reflection on myself. Um, so just remember... There's a there's a little card called the gal in the glass or the guy in the glass talking about the mirror, you know. It's a reflection of who you are, how you feel, and the people that you attract. Um, and so all the faults that I was finding in him, one finger out, three fingers back. Um, so there's all kinds of little cliches you can say in AA, and they're all pretty valid. Um... So I was still sober. I hadn't taken a drink. I would occasionally go to a meeting. I joke and say I would go like at Christmas and Easter. And um, for my first three or four years, I was at a meeting every single day, twice, three times a day. But I think a lot of that was I was hiding out. Um, it's real easy to hide out in a meeting. Not that that's bad, but I wasn't taking responsibility for my schoolwork, for my work work. It was just safe to be in an AA meeting. And I thought, well, it's okay because I'm in an AA meeting. I'm not drinking. Um, so it's real easy to twist things to make them fit your um, needs. So I took a job with United Airlines. I became a flight attendant, moved up to Chicago, went to a couple of meetings up there, so that was pretty neat. Um, subsequently moved back to Tennessee, got divorced, had a really hard time, started going back to meetings again because that pretty much rocked my um, foundation, my belief system, getting a divorce. And I started going back to therapy and started going back to meetings. 
Um, throughout this time, I never really had a really good sponsor, someone I could talk to. Um, I would talk with people in meetings, but I didn't have one person that I felt I could call and talk with honestly. And I think if I, if I think about it now, it's because I didn't want to be called on anything. I didn't want to have to be responsible for my actions and to work the steps and to pray and to be active. So I moved back to Chicago and continued to work for the airlines. And I really missed that joy that I felt when I first got sober because it is joyful. I had so much fun my first three years of sobriety. So I come back to Tennessee for a visit and I see my, I go to a um, symphony with my parents and I'm out having a cigarette. And this guy out of nowhere goes, Jan Guthrie, I always did want to marry you. And I look. And it's this guy from an AA meeting, and I could not remember his name. And I look and I go, Randy? Well, he's my husband today. This started a two-year friendship that I was unwilling to start when I first got sober. Um, and it's been a real gift. The two years that we... We became friends. We got to know one another. We weren't all into the hot and heavy stuff first and then friendship later. We went friendship first. We got to know one another, which was really neat. Um, and he invited me down for Tiki Pa. He said, you know, there's going to be a lot of our old friends there. Why don't you come down? It'll be really fun. And I was pretty wary because at this point I really was trying to work a good program as far as I might not have been going to meetings, but I was reading my literature. And I was aware of my behavior with, with men and realizing that I was trying to find a higher power in somebody. And so I was kind of swearing off men. And at that point, that's when Randy sort of came back in my life. So that was kind of cool how that worked out. Um, so I come down for Tiki Paw. And that was February 22nd of 99. He proposed March 3rd, and we got married March 24th. He has to remind me when our anniversary is. And we now have two beautiful children. Um, the miracles in this program are here. You have to work for them. And there's pain in sobriety. Just because you're sober doesn't mean the problems go away. Just because you stop drinking doesn't mean you stop living. And I've started going back to meetings again. And it's been a real gift. I don't know that I'll ever have that pink cloud that I had when I first got sober, but that's okay. What I have now is becoming more real and deeper. Um, I've worked the steps to the best of my ability. That doesn't mean I need to stop trying to work them or to practice them in all my affairs. It's really simple. It's a very, very simple program. We tend to be um, complicated people, or so we think. We tend to think we're really unique and that our stories are n brand new. No one's ever heard how bad my life was. But if you look at it simply and you realize I'm just a person trying to do the best I know with what I've got and remembering to pray and to laugh and have fun, Find somebody you can really connect with and talk to. And I don't mean male-female. I mean get a sponsor. Find someone you trust. And get involved. Go to the dances. Pick up the ashtrays. I really want to say something that's really deep and meaningful. <laughs> but I don't want to try that hard to impress you. I just am. I used to drink. I wanted to die. I went to an AA meeting, and I found people who wanted to live and wanted to laugh. And so I hung out there. And it started to rub off. And I stuck around. And I fall on my face, but they pick me up, and they love me anyway. Um, and I still find myself struggling with anxiety. And that may just be a part of me. And when I can remember that it is all going to be okay, like this morning I was freaking out about 
my kids freaking out and running around. And my husband goes, it'll be okay. And it is. Um, it's so funny because I have been stressed out worrying about these kids, but you know what's really cool is that I have these kids as a result of being sober, and I look at them, and I'm amazed that this is something that God has given to me, and it's something that I've been entrusted with, and I don't want to mess it up, but I may, um, because it is a family disease, and it is genetic in my estimation. That's the way I was able to accept it. Um, that genetically there's something in my brain that doesn't produce these things that make me happy, so I have to seek out other things, be it coffee, be it cigarettes, be it men, be it alcohol, gambling. Not that that was ever my thing, but anything that takes me out of myself takes me farther from God. Um, and I went to the women's meeting on uh, yesterday, and someone was said something that just made so much sense. You know, we need to stop worrying so much about our relationships with you know, the in a love relationship and start worrying about a relationship with God and at the risk of sounding like one of the Christian coalition people. <laughs> it really works. That is the key. And that's something that I pray that all of you can find if you're still struggling with your sobriety. Finding a higher power that works for you, be it Buddha, be it a rock, be it God. Don't, don't choose a, like a guy or a girl, though. That their feet are made of clay. <laughs> Find your own higher power and turn your will and your life over to them. With me, it's I get down on my knees and I yell, God, please take it away. I don't want it anymore. When you struggle so hard, I remember going to a meeting and there was this old guy and he would say, you know, this hot poker, it's burning my hand, it's burning my hand. And then someone says, well, let go of it. And he goes, no, it's mine. <laughs> and I can really identify with that. Knowing that, I don't know, it's like it takes the power away. If I don't have this trauma, if I don't have this drama, then who am I? I'm just a mom driving a minivan with two kids. Where's the excitement in that? It's very exciting. This is something I ne I'm living the dreams I never knew I had because I stayed sober through the grace of God. I remember when I was still flying, and at one point, this was before I came back down for Tiki Pop, when I really wasn't going to meetings, and I was thinking to myself, I'm just going to move to London and start drinking there because nobody will care because it's London, and I'll just be like a pub girl. I'll be a cute little pub girl, and I'll just drink my pint, and it won't matter because that's what, you know, I've got, like, Scott-Irish blood in me anyway, so I'll fit right in. And um, so I told Randy this. We were talking on the phone or writing a letter or something. And he said, don't do that. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it, it, he, like, he popped that bubble. that was like, remember, that's not reality, um, thankfully. But that's where I was. I was thinking that that, this is when I was about 10 years sober, and I was thinking that that was an option again. Um, and that's scary because I got away from my meetings. I got away from people who were trying to do the same thing I was. And um, not to say that Randy's my higher power by any means, but he really helped me to get back on track. So thank you. Um, work a fourth step. It's important to get all that junk out of your head. Take the third step and really try and do it well to the best of your ability. Understand that there is a loving God who will care for you and accepts you just the way you are. Keep working the 11th step. Keep praying. Pray, pray, pray. Get on your knees if it works for you. Um, and if you're resistant, try it anyway. Help somebody else. Talk to people. You know, one of the neat God things, I remember when I was taking this job with United and I was, there was this form to fill out and it says, did you ever have a problem with alcohol or depression? <laughs> and so I really had a quandary. Do I fill it out? Am I honest? Should I tell them that I am an alcoholic? 
And so I was really having a hard time. And so I stop and I look up. I'm up in Chicago and I'm in the medical office. And there's this little piece of paper stuck up there, AA meetings in the chapel, 530 on Wednesday. And I went, oh, okay, thanks, God. So I wrote it down. I'm like, yes. And nothing ever came of it. Um, but if you're honest in all your affairs, things tend to have a way of working out. Brutally honest sometimes. Realize when you need a kick in the pants. Realize when you're doing a great job. That's real important for a lot of us. Realize when you're doing a really good job um, without taking it to the egomaniac aspect of it. Believe that miracles happen. Laugh a lot. Um, I'm struggling for something really powerful and moving to say to you. Um, So my last drink was January of 87. And by the grace of God and you people, I haven't had a drink since then. I picked up my white chip on January 27th, 1987. Um, I was 21 when I got sober. And young people was instrumental in helping me find a belief system, knowing that there were people who were just like me who hated living drunk but did were terrified to live sober, hated living in that fear of people, places, and things. Um, yes, I still struggle with financial insecurity. I live in life. Um, but I am walking that road of happy destiny, Um, And I get excited when I think about standing at the doorway and seeing all the things that are there. Um, The literature is really important. I haven't been reading it very much lately. I brought my big book, and I was going to do some cramming sessions, but then I couldn't find my big book. So I guess that was God saying, well, you know, you should have been preparing a little more instead of the weekend of the conference. Um, Literature is really good. I really like the 12 and 12. I like the big book, too. Miracles happen. Showing up, doing the next right thing. I was really surprised you guys asked me to speak, and I'm very honored. And um, I know nervousness happens, and you're just a bunch of alcoholics, so why should I be nervous? Um, because I really like you guys, and I want to let you know that sobriety, if there are any new folks, sobriety really is worth it. Um, You will still struggle. You'll still stumble. But that's why everybody's here. That's why it's a fellowship. The unity, just like if you ever turn the chip over and you read what's on there, to thine own self be through unity, recovery, and service. Isn't that what it says? Those things really work, and whenever you're in doubt and you don't know what to do, say the serenity prayer. Um, I don't know. I, I'm grateful for all that I've been given, and that's all I've got. Thank you all. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.